Amen. When she said transitioning, I didn't realize that was my cue. <laughs> Did you do that? Yeah, yeah. I'd make a joke there, but I won't. <laughs> Just know that I'm laughing on the inside. I have a little ring going on in, in my uh, mic here. So uh, let, let's just open in prayer this morning. Father, we worship you, we praise you, we love you, we thank you. Thank you, God, that when we seek you, we find you. When we worship you, you are there ready to receive. Oh, there is so much relationship that is built in worship. We cannot even understand relationship without it. It is the recognition of the creation worshiping he who created it. Oh, we worship you, Lord. We declare your will be done. I declare that this morning. Your will be done right here, right now. We didn't come here just to spend some time to say that we put in our time this week. We came here to find you. We came here to in unity, seek your face. Because you said there's power in that unity. So we trust you for it, Lord. We thank you for it. I give you my mouth. I give you my hands, my feet. I give you everything that I am. I say yes to use me however you wish. Just speak to us, Lord. Show us the depths of that which you've promised. We love you desperately. In Jesus' name, amen. So we have that mic, right? I want to have that mic ready and available because remember I said you know these last few weeks as we're getting ready for this transition there I see how I worked that in <laughs> kind of cool wasn't it yeah that's right that's right it was smooth as as we are moving into this new time you know the Lord said to be ready and so these last few weeks, this is an open forum. I, I don't want you to worry about the online. I mean, we are online, but this is about us. The Lord said that a few weeks ago. This is about us. And so as we go through what the Lord has this morning, if you have a question, I want you to raise your hand. I, I want to bring that out because chances are, if you have it, others might as well. And it's important that we're pressing into him in this relationship. You know, how in the world can we have an expectation of something to happen that's never happened before, which is what he said, if we keep doing the same stuff? Our focus on him just has to be there. It has to be intense. It has to be real. It has to be what it is all about. And, and that is a normal setup when it comes to worship. But is it in hearing from him? Like, do we come here and 
when there's going to be something said or a message or whatever, is, is, it a, is it about pressing into him, what do you have for me this morning? Or is it, you know, I'm kind of excited, maybe I'll learn something I didn't know and add to my intellectual capacity about who God is. No, I don't know. We, we have to answer that for ourselves, each of us. But here's the trick. He said, pretty simply, if you seek me, you'll find me. If we seek him, we'll find him. And that isn't just about a overwhelming feeling of his presence. And uh, I just, you know, get these goosebumps. I know he's there and yeah, I can live and that, that just gets me through to the next one not about that. I mean, those are great. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> They're great. But it's not about that. It's about the abiding. I, I find myself, it, can you be jealous in a good way? I don't know if that's even possible, but can you? I find myself jealous in a good way of Enoch. Now, in reality, we only get to read a small part of who he was and his life. But he got to be with God so much, God finally said, you know what, don't bother going home. <laughs> Just stick around. You're, you're kind of a fixture here anyways. So why don't you just stay? Imagine, imagine the relationship that he had with the Lord for the Lord to just keep him. Imagine that. See, you have to believe that that's available to you even right now. Do you believe that? I mean, we can read that it was available certainly in Enoch's time, but here's the thing. The Lord has promised us more. More. What could be more then that's going and just spending time all the time with him in heaven. What could be more than that? What Enoch did. I could think something. Can you? Him coming here. Him coming here because with Enoch, he was the only one affected. But when the Lord comes here, manifests through his church, it will not just be those individuals that are affected. It'll be the whole world. It'll be the revival. You ever think about that? You ever just sit and really quantify what that means? I, I've shared this before about the vision I had of the snowflakes and all and, and I, I shared all that. I'm not going to share it again. But basically, what the Lord was showing me was how many people were going to be affected for the kingdom through ignition. And each snowflake represented a person. Now, if you know me, I like to take evidence, I like to take things that I've learned, and I like to mathematically figure things out. So I did. And this could blow your mind. It blew my mind. I mean, not at the time. But I, I and, and a lot of it was guesstimate, but I, I took a guesstimate of square feet, how many snowflakes were falling in a square foot time every minute because I knew about how long that the snow came down for when it finally totally cleared from when he had told me. So I guesstimated how many, then I went and measured out the courtyard, or the, the, the green, what's it called, the green? Uh, University of Delaware? And it wasn't green that day, it was white. Went out and measured the square footage there and calculated all that out and 
came to a little over a billion with a B. And I thought, oh, wow, I must have calculated something wrong. <laughs> and then I heard about this old prophecy back in the 80s by Bob Jones, who I didn't know who he was. You've got to remember, I came from legalistic backgrounds. I knew a Bob Jones, but it was a very different Bob Jones. I won't tell those stories. No, I, I got to say this. I did get kicked out of his school, though. <laughs> yeah, it, it was so, if, if you knew why. It, I, wasn't, I was there for college for a weekend. I was there as a pr prospective student. I, I just thought, this has to be a joke. You're not allowed to talk to girls after 6 p.m.? Because they because they turn a certain light on in the hallways or in, in these walkways, and I'm, oh, this is a joke, right? So I did, and they asked me to leave. Okay. Guess I won't be going there to school. Anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to derail. Father, forgive me. You even warned me not to. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I want to say back in the 80s, Bob Jones, a different Bob Jones, he prophesied of a coming revival. And guess what he called it? A billion soul harvest. That rocked me. Why? Because it, it wasn't just awesome enough that God prophesied that there is coming a billion soul harvest the cool thing to me was he showed it to me. He showed it to me personally. Quantified it to me personally without me knowing about anything. And it was so awesome. So do you believe that? Really think about what that revival means. Alexa and I were talking about this this week. She she and, I, she and I both had, I won't say troubling, they were difficult, but we, we both had dreams that the Lord was showing us that there's coming a time where privacy will be a dream. <laughs> when the Lord fills you with his Holy Spirit, and just as he said in Isaiah where they will seek after you to grab your hand to say, I want to know what you know. I want to know the God that is light in your life. I'll tell you what, people can be relentless when they're in fear, when they see something that they desperately want and see no other way to get it. They'll stop at nothing. The woman with the 12-year issue of blood, she stopped at nothing. She didn't even care about getting Jesus' attention. She just wanted to touch his robe. If I just touch his robe, I'll be healed. I'll tell you what, there was nothing going to stop her. Nothing. Nothing. Why? Because her faith saw a measure to be able to fix what she had. In other words, she believed. She believed. Now, I assume she believed because she saw. Maybe she saw other miracles go on, or maybe she heard. Maybe she didn't even see. Maybe she heard about other... This is driving me nuts. To stand in front of it. <laughs> I keep going around it. It's driving me up the wall. Maybe she saw, you know, these healings happening. Maybe she heard these healings happening. Whatever it was built her faith to the point where she said, I have just got to get there in proximity. If you don't think that's going to happen again, you're fooling yourself. 
If you think that's just going to happen to me or to Alexis, you're fooling yourself. You know what? How about in faith? Go ahead and put a bunch of chairs out on your front lawn. Because <laughs> there's coming a day where they're going to be all over your yard just wanting to talk to you. Not because you're God, but because you know him. And you know him intimately. So when we talk about this billion soul harvest, picture that. Picture what that means. Going home at 2 o'clock in the morning because you've been involved in these revival times, these healing times. You just go in and you literally go into a crowd out on your front doorstep. You go in just to get a few hours sleep. You lay there and you can't sleep. Because you know on the doorstep are people that need him. And you say, okay, oh Lord, you're my strength. Let's go talk to these people. I can't wait. I mean, I'm not saying I can't wait to not have sleep. <laughs> Lord is my strength. I can't wait. I'll tell you what I can't wait for. I can't wait for a world that's ready to listen. That's what I can't wait for. That's what this shaking is. The shaking is rattling the foundations of the world so that some will hear. So that some will not, they'll be more afraid of having closed ears than having open ears. Now all of a sudden it won't matter if you believe in the gifts. <laughs> in fact, it, it's going to be pretty important that you do believe in the gifts. It won't matter the things that have divided us for 2,000 years. What will matter is the Holy Spirit so thick and heavy on each of you. So when you think about revival, think about that. What does that mean? What does it mean to take that outward? I've told you this before that we're not a normal church. God never called us to be a normal church. Thank God. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Because, see, a normal church would try to draw in. I think you've noticed by now that we don't do that. If we were supposed to, man, we have failed. No. This church is called to go out. He's preparing us for that very thing. Go out everywhere. Every pocket of influence that he is building into your life, you have a responsibility for that is coming. That's pretty huge when you think about it. And the way you fuel that is your own faith. Believe it or don't believe it. If you don't believe it, then it doesn't mean that he has to use you but he will use this church. That is one of the promises that we cling to. So when you think about revival, really think about what that means. You know, one of the greatest things in my life, one of the greatest joys, let me put it that way, is when I get to lead somebody to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. When they come to a point of, okay, yeah, I get it. And they pray and ask him into their heart. Oh, man, I get to be a part of that. You get to be a part of that. But now it's going to be so much more. 
I mean, imagine the times. Imagine the times when you're out on your front lawn. You're just praying with people. You're loving people. And here comes this car that pulls up. And they take this person out in a wheelchair and they wheel them up to you. Say, can God do anything about this? You say, absolutely. Absolutely, he can. And you pray over them and they're immediately healed. You know, right now we pray over people and and sometimes there's a fast healing, sometimes they're not. I've talked to the Lord so much about that. And he said to me, there is coming a day. He, he didn't explain the time we're in now, but he said there's coming a day where those will be immediate and complete. Think about that. Think about that. Think about that when it's coming not just from one person. Think about when it's coming and spreading. (laughs) Think about what this revival is going to be like. And when you think about it, let it swell yourself up in faith. Saying, yes, I believe it. Yes, Lord, I'm in agreement with it. Let nothing stand in the way of me recognizing that. What you want, Lord, don't let anything stand in the way. Nothing. I really feel the burden of his heart in getting this across because we're on the doorstep of this. You're on the doorstep of this. It is upon us. That is no joke. That is a heavy responsibility. But with that responsibility comes amazing joy. Amazing intimacy with the Lord. I tell you, when, when you let the Lord work through you to do something extraordinary that is outside of you, That is just the most amazing feeling. It's a feeling of real partnership. Real partnership with the Holy Spirit. So as we're getting ready for this, he's given us these few weeks to prepare. And one of the things that he laid on my heart this morning as I was with him this morning, I said, what, what do you want me to share? And what he said was to not take anything into our own hands, but to let him do it. We have our responsibility. Our responsibility is a yes. Our responsibility is to not put anything in his way. Our responsibility is to move in a way that he can fully work through us. That's our responsibility. That's it. Very simple. That yes, and then worship. We worship in our yes. Sometimes, yep, I'll get you in one second. Sometimes... We can put things ahead of God's promise. That's a dangerous place to be. We, 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 yeah, absolutely. We know a few of them in the Bible. Ishmael's one. That, that kind of has had a little bit of effect, right? <laughs> like huge. But even at the beginning of the church... It happened. You know what? In fact, I want to turn there. And let me, let me bring this out and then remember your question, okay? Uh, turn to John chapter 14. 
Actually, no. Let's, well, yeah, I want to read this first. John chapter 14. Because Jesus, as he was speaking to his disciples before he went to the cross, he was letting them know that there's a coming Holy Spirit, letting them know what's, what's coming, even though they obviously had no capacity to understand, right? Because Peter even fought him on it. But he's warning them and all this. And, and I want to read verse 12 because we refer to this a lot. John chapter 14, verse 12 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And then that next phrase, and greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. So again, going back, he said that we, that those who follow him, and it goes to quantify that in chapter 15, by the way. What does it mean to follow him? What does it mean to be his? Well, it is about obedience. It's all about relationship with him. But he said, greater works. Why does Jesus say that? He said, because the law requires two, at least two witnesses to be established. And he said, I'm going to the Father. So with you, there are two. What the enemy has done that Jesus at this time was about to pay for, because he hadn't gone to the cross yet, he said that everything I have promised will be yours. To those who obey, to those who let him do what he wants, which is part of that obedience. It's, it's not just about, well, you know, I, I don't do this, I don't do that, and I, I got this list of things that I do, and, you know, I got, I got my lists, so I'm obedient. <laughs> it's not that. In fact, it's so much more than that. You know what the obedience is and what it boils down to? Does he have your everything? See, because in contrast, he gave everything. He gave everything for you. Does he have your everything? Or do you keep things aside? Well, we just kind of set this aside because this is just mine right here. And we set it aside. See, that's part of obedience. But at the beginning, I want you to turn to Acts chapter 1. At the beginning, when Jesus died on the cross, rose from the grave, was with the disciples for 40 days, and then ascended to heaven, he told them of a comforter that was coming. He gave them a very simple command, and I want to read it. Acts chapter 1, verse 4, and this, this was... While Jesus was with them before he ascended, he, in fact, this was the last thing he said to them. Except maybe bye, I don't know. I don't know if he said bye or not. <laughs> and while staying with them, he ordered them, talking about the disciples, not to depart from Jerusalem, but to what? Wait. Wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not, not many days from now. So, God made it real simple. He didn't say, hey, go up here and here's this list of things to do. He said, go up and wait. And wait. Now, in reality, we know from being later, because it's history now, we know they only had to wait for 10 days. Man, I could almost wait 10 days for anything. But think about the situation they were in. 
Jesus just ascended, two angels standing there and saying, what are you standing around looking at? He'll return as he left. You know, imagine, okay, uh, let's, go, let, let's go find a place. And they do, they find an upper room. Jesus told us just to wait. So they go up there and they start waiting. And they're worshiping and they're praying, I'm sure. And they're waiting. But then comes this little angst. And see, we know this because it happens to us. When God tells you to do something, he gives you this massive promise. This massive promise of what he's going to do in your life. And all you're to do is trust him and press into him. But then, you know, it's kind of like, yeah, did I miss it? I mean, you know, it's, it's been years now and we haven't seen this. Maybe, maybe, maybe I misheard the promise. Maybe, maybe he took back the promise. Or maybe, okay, wait, no, this, this makes it, maybe I'm supposed to do something. That's exactly what happened at the beginning. Let's look at it. A few verses later. Again, Acts chapter 1, verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from Mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they, where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus and Simon, the zealot and Judas, the son of James. All these were, were in one accord. Right? Devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and all of that. If it had stopped there, it would have been awesome. In those days, which in those days, those 10 days, <laughs> I don't know which day it was, but in those days, verse 15, Peter stood up among the brothers. Remember Peter, the guy who liked to put his foot in his mouth? There's something inside of him that just had to move at something. The company of pers <clears throat> persons was about 120, and he said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke of beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. And then it talks about the field. That, but verse 20. For it is written in the book of Psalms. And this is where, where Peter was getting it from. May his camp become desolate and let there be no one who dwell in it. And let another take his office. Verse 21. So one of the men... So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us as a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two people, Joseph called Barsabbas, who is also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, you, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship for which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. I can just imagine the Lord. I said, wait. I said, wait. Just wait 10 days. Just wait. Just wait. But they didn't. They cast lots, and they decided that the Lord decided Matthias. Now, I'm sure both men were good. I, I'm, not, I'm not arguing against that. But you can see Scripture later and realize that God had a different one in mind. 
One that Jesus met on the road to Damascus all by himself. See, what had not been given yet is why they had to wait. Do you, by the way, do you know what casting lots is? It's kind of like throwing dice. You know, it's kind of like, well, if it's a seven, it's Matthias. If it's a four, it's, it's a, who's the other guy, Barsabbas or whatever it is. Okay, oh, didn't get it that, okay, throw him again. No, I, I don't know that they threw him twice. I don't even know exactly if it's dice, but it is that sort of thing. It is chance. And putting that chance then, righteously so, on their part, meant putting the decision in God's hands. When God already gave the command, he said, wait, just wait. Can you imagine a few days later after the Holy Spirit fell, how that answer might have been different? Peter was different. We know that. He was completely different. So maybe the Holy Spirit would have told him, no, I, I have something planned. Don't worry about it. That position will be, will be filled. Don't worry about it. I just find it interesting the culmination of what that meant when they took this into their own hands. These 12 guys, the 12 closest guys to Jesus when he walked this earth. And yet, a few years later, you see the division. You see the division start to creep up when the Lord gives Peter a vision and says, yeah, guess what? This is about the Gentiles too. They're included. Wait, what? You see that division even later when the disciples tried to put a burden on the Gentiles that was undue. And at that point, Paul had already been called had already gone through 17 years of the Lord refining, and Paul stood up against him. I just wonder, what would have been different if they had just waited? Nothing else. Just worshiped, just prayed, just showed their love toward God and waited to receive not trying to work out the shipping for God. I'm just waiting to receive. Not calling up UPS. Hey, you know how to get to my house, right? No, just waiting on God. Just waiting on God. Letting him do it. What would have been different? You know, Georgia brought up another one a little bit ago. Hagar and Ishmael. Right? With Abraham. Or at that time, Abram. Or no, yeah, it was Abraham. Yeah, if, you, if you want to look at that one, that's in Genesis, I think it's 16. Yeah, let, let's go to it. I think it's Genesis 16. Yeah, Genesis 16, verse 1. Now Sarah, or Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children. She had a female Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. Now, remember on this, they had the promise, right? The Lord had promised to Abraham that he would be the father of many nations. Look up to the sky. Yeah, your, your, your children will, will be more than that. Look at the sand on the seashore. They'll be more than that. I mean, that's quite a promise. When you think about it, that's a huge promise. And, and so literally, I think we're about 10 years into that promise right at this point. So 10 years, I mean, that's different. That's not 10 days. You know, 10 years is a long time. You know, we've been waiting here for about that long. I guess we're, we're at about eight or nine years with Ignition for the things he's promised us. 
maybe, maybe close to 10 years. So right about that time, you start wondering, okay, did I miss something? Is there something I'm supposed to do? Lord, Lord, forgive me if I was supposed to do something and you've been waiting on me all this time. That's kind of what was going on in Sarah's mind. She said to Abram, Behold, now the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go in to my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. And Abram, like the ding-dong that he was, listened to the voice of Sarai. Now, now, by the way, it's, it, it's both of their faults. It's, it's just not his fault. It's just not her fault. But I'm telling you, they got ahead of God. See, God in his wisdom is explaining. You, you got to remember what's been going on. Okay? About 200 years before Abraham was the Tower of Babel. So we're, we're like way, way in history where God gave away the nations to demonic principalities to rule and to steward. That's the, that's the, the earth at that time. You can imagine the godlessness, if you will. That's why they were separated in the first place at the tower. And yet God said, I am going to make a nation for myself. And he picked Abraham to do it from. And so he makes this promise to Abraham. God has this picture in mind of what that means. Literally, redemption of the world. But to Abraham, the picture is, I'm going to get a son. It's very, very myopic, very small scale. Do you see what I'm saying? Maybe if Abraham really had the faith to have a bigger picture when it started, then it might have been different. Because he didn't have the big picture in mind at the 10th year when they were saying, <laughs> just not happening with Sarah. Here, may, maybe do it this way because in that culture, that's still your son. That's not what God wanted. And if you keep reading, you see that immediately where Sarah and Hagar did not get along so well. And Abraham being the typical guy, you know what, <laughs> you got authority, go deal with it yourself. When he's the one that was part of it. It made a mess. It made a mess because they got ahead of God. They got ahead of God's promises. They let their, their faith fail to the point where they figured they needed to do something about it just like the disciples up in that upper room. Don't be that here. Don't be that here. Because, see, the promise is on God. It's not on us to help him fulfill it. It's on him to do it. Keep the main thing the main thing. And what is the main thing? You falling absolutely head over heels in love with him. That's it. That's the main thing. And then as you do that, as you're building this relationship with him and he's showing you things that he wants you to do, then you just step and you just do it. That's it. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, bring the microphone up to him though. Testing. Um, Pastor, um, can you talk about um, what we're supposed to do to prepare for God? And in men's group this morning, Richard and I was talking, and um, 
we, we both, both agreed that the one thing that we could do is go to God. And then Isaac said something on the same lines. And there was a song that she sang that was, um, had a verse in it that said, when there's nothing, I don't know what the verse was saying, go to God. And, um, and then you talk about, oh, no, all you talk about is going to God. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking, that's exactly what the Spirit is telling me to do. Go to God and love God. And I'm thinking, well, how can I love God more than love him now? I don't know. How, tell me, how can I love God? How can you love God more? <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the answer is actually pretty simple. He'll show you. We aren't the ones that grow our capacity of our heart. He does. We give our obedience in seeking him. We give our obedience of faith. God has promised you something, right? He's promised you healing. You have the faith of that total, complete, perfect healing. You and I have talked about this. You have the faith of that. The promise... You hang on the promise, but only as a matter of, that's what God said he's going to do, and I believe it. You go after God in your heart as a friend. It, it's, it's like building any other relationship. It's spending time. It's letting him know how you feel. Don't assume God knows how you feel. I mean, he does, but don't assume that. Because here's the thing, the enemy doesn't. You declaring how you feel about God is as much a slap in the enemy's face as it is building your relationship with the Lord. So don't, don't just say, well, I don't really need to do that because God already knows me. He knows me. <laughs> yeah, that's why he's trying to push you because he knows you. And he, he just want, wants you to be obedient in going after him. Yeah, did you have? I just wanted to say thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. <laughs> You're welcome, Michael. Absolutely. But that's what we're responsible for, is just going after him. And, and there's going to be a lot of white noise around us. And, and I know it's loud right now, but it's going to get even worse. You know, wait, wait, till, wait till all the death starts to happen. You know, can you imagine? In, in our lifetime, and really in the last probably four or five generations, we haven't seen massive death. We've never seen it here in the United States. Close we came to that was us killing each other and that was a civil war. We've never seen a plague that literally can wipe out the entire nation like what has happened in the past. You can imagine the fear that ramps up. When you don't have a firm hold of God's promises to you, to you personally, when you don't have a foothold of those things, fear can creep in. And so it's important to understand your role is to go after him with everything you are, right? Hold on one sec. To go after him with everything that you are and make sure you let him do the rest. When we start this in a couple of weeks, I wish I could lay out for you what that looks like. I don't know. It's kind of like what he said to the disciples, go, go into Jerusalem and wait. You know, he's told us, hey, we're going to have this shift in August.
waiting for some more information. But there isn't. What I do know is it's about him. What I do know is our part. Our part is just seeking him, just worshiping, just praying, just letting him know our heart. Even praying together out loud so we each know each other's heart. Boy, there's so much power in that. So much power. That's why praying together is so powerful. When we pray together, we hear other people's hearts. Do you know I learn more about a person's heart when I hear them pray than anything else? They could sit there and they could tell me the world and everything else, but when I hear them pray, that's how they're talking to their creator. You learn something about a person when you do that. That's what's coming. That's what's coming. And it is this intimacy with him that that's almost like the field that he'll be able to plant in. I don't know what it looks like. I know what it looks like kind of the first time all this happened, which I've explained to you. I, I know it's going to be that and probably that on steroids, you know, in, in a much bigger thing. I, I know even back then, we didn't try to make anything happen. <laughs> I didn't even know to try to make anything happen. I mean, Thankfully, thank you, Lord, that I was just ignorant in that. We just waited. We just sought him. We put that on him. That's his responsibility. And in doing that, he will do his will here. All those promises that he has said for ignition and for us individually, he will accomplish all of those. We're coming to a time where it won't just be us sitting here. This is preparation time. This is time of getting ready, of being unified, of that unification building a wall against the enemy. That's where we're at right now. That's where the disciples were after Jesus ascended. So just trust in what he's about to do. Yeah, Alexis. I'm going to ask a question on behalf of, um, I think, what has been a struggle for believers for a long time when it comes to this, this subject, and that is where Scripture often gets quoted about God not being the author of confusion and that to wait and to not take the reins within your positional authority in the church, as many pastors feel strongly about, that it will lead to an eruption of chaos. Mm -hmm. And I know you kind of spoke to this last week, but, but I just wanted to have you answer again to help people on why, you know, even why there has been the resistance based on that. Like, like there has been a desire to control, mm -hmm. almost like trying to help out the ebb and flow of the Spirit, as if we even could. Yeah. But why does that drive so many believers, and they really believe it's coming from a good place? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, that's coming out of 1 Corinthians 14. And part of understanding what, it, what does that mean, you know, it was interesting because at, at the beginning of this process, I think I told you guys before that, that you know, the Lord started opening up gifts and, and it, it just would come upon us. Uh, it, it wasn't anything practiced or anything like that. It just would come upon us. And I, I remember, you know, in the, in the six months that I had studied everything, one of the things that I had studied pretty heavily was was 1 Corinthians 14, and, and the fact that, you know, if, if, there, if there are tongues in a service, um, there will always be, you know, an interpretation of that. And we were very blessed as Ignition, and the Lord was very patient 
um, with me in, in learning what that means and what it means in that chaos. Because when tongues did break out and when they'd break out in a service, there always was. There was always interpretation. Somebody else would manifest and give an interpretation. There were times where the person who gave the tongues would have an interpretation, but there was always an interpretation. By the way, I'm not talking about just somebody explaining something. I'm talking about just how tongues is a gift to speak out an unknown tongue. Interpretation is also a gift. That interpretation is not you thinking, well, you know, one of those words kind of sounded like this, and so I think it meant this. That's not the gift of interpretation. The gift of interpretation is when the Lord fills you and what you are hearing is his words. Now, it can happen a few, few ways. I, again, I, I speak of this personally where there have been times where I have heard tongues being said and if the Lord was going to have me give an interpretation or be in, in agreement of an interpretation, I am hearing those words in English. I mean, I'm hearing the tongues and maybe you could say it's the Lord's voice then speaking them in English to me. That would be a gift of interpretation, not, not a gift of figuring it out. <laughs> That's not what that is. So later then, there came times where there were tongues where there was no interpretation specifically in the, in the service, and it always wrapped around warfare. Somebody would manifest in the service, and we are praying over them, and all of a sudden, war tongues pops out. I don't know that you necessarily need an interpretation of that. Now, one could look at that because it was a Sunday morning service and say, that is chaos. They'd be misunderstanding it. The scene can be chaotic, but what God is doing is divine. Again, don't try to label things in your own understanding and what was going on in the church at Corinth, remember they were new believers. They were new believers and they had this gift of the Holy Spirit. They had, they had giftings popping up all over the place. But they, they did not have what we have today, which is their example. Right? They had Paul who wrote them two letters who had gone to see them. But they did not have the past experience of other lives to be able to look and see what that meant. What does it mean to steward a gift? Do you know when you're given a gift, you are expected to steward that gift? It says in 1 Corinthians 14 that, uh, talking about prophecy specifically, but, but I believe it applies to all the, the manifestational gifts that that prophecy is subject to the prophet. Now what that means, that doesn't mean that the prophet decides what the prophecy is. What it means is, is there is a monicum of understanding from that prophet of how to deliver that. Okay? So for instance, what I think Paul was trying to teach them in terms of tongues, there will be times and he even gives this example in chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians, there will be times when you might be sitting there and the Lord is giving you a prophetic word. Or, or maybe he is bubbling up something else in you. Maybe he's bubbling up uh, tongues. Maybe he's bubbling up a prayer over healing. Anything. You know, maybe he's doing that in you while at the same time, something is already underway over here. What he means by the prophecy is subject to the prophets. And what Paul was talking about in chapter 14 is an order in which those things are done. Not to keep chaos away, 
Why was it important? Why, why was that a big word? Well, God is not the author of confusion. Well, you know, that actually can be debated in the Word of God. Because in 2 Kings chapter 22, or maybe it's 1 Kings 22, where he sent that angel to be a lying spirit in Ahab's prophets, kind of caused confusion, didn't it? In fact, it caused confusion to the point of Ahab's death, which is what God wanted. Can't say God didn't author that because you have to read 1 Corinthians, or sorry, I think it is 1 Kings 22. You have to read that and you see he's the one that did it all. What it is saying in that chaos, in that confusion, and what Paul is saying in chapter 14 is if God's goal in that is not being accomplished, it has to be changed. That's why Paul said, I'd rather speak five words prophetically from the Lord than 10,000 in a tongue. Does that mean those five words were more powerful than the 10,000 in the tongue? I don't think so. I think what was going on in that church was a need for clarity in what those gifts represented and how they were used. Paul said they're not for you. If you get a gift, it's not for you. It's for the bride. When he does a gift for, through you, it is for the bride. Now the beauty of that is we kind of get to be a part of it too. If God uses you to lay hands on somebody and pray over them, you get to be a part of that. Even though that may not be for you, you get to be a part of that. So I think the confusion and the chaos had a lot to do with the fact that they were not listening to the basics. They were not understanding the basics of relationship with Jesus Christ. And they were attributing it to this gifting. Well, if I just have this gifting and I manifest in this, I'm close to Christ. That's not true. If, if, if that's true, then there's a lot of people who have a lot of problems. Your intimacy with Jesus Christ is just that it's yours. It's yours. The gifting is intended to be used by someone who is in intimacy with Jesus Christ. Now, the problem is the gifts are given without recompense, right? They, he doesn't take them back when he gives them. So you do have people that use gifts for the wrong purpose or in the wrong way. It was never God's intent for that to happen. And I believe if you look historically at the church at Corinth, that's what was happening there. And so the chaos wasn't that it seemed chaotic in the room, although it probably was. The chaos was that they weren't seeing the truth. They weren't learning who Jesus is and was. So when we have a deliverance, which, trust me, it's going to happen, there's no other word to say but that that is chaotic. Why? Because it's the enemy. Don't think that, oh, that shouldn't happen in a Sunday morning. Don't think that. That is going to happen in a Sunday morning, and it's supposed to happen in a Sunday morning. Because the deliverance is the very reason why we eat and breathe. To bring his kingdom here. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate everything that you've shared, Greg. It's very interesting to me. There is a tendency, let me speak for myself. 
to have my relationship with Jesus very silo oriented. It's Jesus and me, and to a great extent, that is absolutely true. That intimacy is between Jesus and me. But the Bible also says that we are a peculiar people. We are a holy nation. And when I hear we're talking about changing up and coming together and being in a big circle, there is an understanding of unity that I am still open to understand. And I know you've mentioned deliverance and, and things that can happen. I'm, I'm just, I'm curious, um, somewhat cautious. I certainly don't want to quench the spirit. And I, yeah. and I think there are some of us here that are very concerned about that, that we go to a place where we grieve or quench the Holy Spirit. And I know that's not our yeah. hearts. Right. And, but, but I think interacting together, it's something we need to learn. And I think this would be a great opportunity to do that. Does that, does that make sense? It does. It does. And, and I can speak from a little bit of experience with this because remember where I came from as a cessationist. And then I'm learning all this stuff for the first time and learning it in church. Like literally things are happening and and, you know, things would happen. And Acts 17, 11 became a very important verse to me because, you know, there's a prerequisite in Acts 17, 11 to proving it out. It said receiving with an open heart. And, and so that's what I would do. In being in tune with him, he did many things that I didn't understand, you know, Certainly at the time, I didn't understand it. And by the way, it's going to happen again. You know, I, I don't know what those are. And, and obviously, the groundwork is that if we knew, it wouldn't be a surprise, but it will be a surprise. He's just going to do things that we don't understand. Why? Because he's God. And there has to be this place of faith that we believe things. But everything that happens... I took back to the word of God. Okay, first time, you know, that Anissa manifested ecstatically. I didn't understand it, but I knew it was God. Why? Because I'm asking questions in my mind and he's answering me. So I, I didn't understand it. I'd never seen it before. But then afterwards, I went back to my Bible. I said, okay, Lord, show me this. Show me in your word because everything is found in his character and he did things that oh my goodness that was that actually in here before lord of course it was i just didn't see it that way i didn't see it in that depth and and so where we have to be careful about that when you talk about the potential of quenching the holy spirit is when we say no to something because we, one, we don't understand, or two, we can't control. Ooh, man, especially that second one, that gets in the way of God's power. When we want to control something is, is when we do quench the Holy Spirit. Um, what does it mean to give God your yes and the Holy Spirit can do through you whatever he wants? I don't know. I mean, I've, I've seen a lot of things. I, I know personally people that, you know, got what they call slain in the spirit. And I don't, I don't like all these terms. You know, for me, it was just, man, they, they got wiped out there on the floor and, you know, let them be. You know, that, it, Wendy told us a story of that happening to her. It was like overnight, right? It was like really a long time. Yeah, so, you know, and we have seen that in ignition, and, I'm, and I remember noticing that and thinking, man, alive, I wish I could sleep that peaceful. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of awesome. Slay me too. <laughs> Do I understand it? I don't know. Do I believe it's God? Absolutely. Because even in my spirit, and this is something why 
your relationship cannot just be vertical. And, and that's what the Lord said, right? You, your relationships have to be horizontal, iron sharp and iron. Because there are things that will happen that may not be of God or might be of God but not purely how God wants it to be. And it is in the culmination of those relationships where that is also shown. But that's why he's wanted us to become a family here. Because that's how we learn. We don't control that way, do you understand? It's not about control. It's really about seeking him and agreement with his plan. So it is scary to go into something you don't understand. I, I Believe me, I know I've been through it many times. It, it is difficult. But that is where the personal relationship is the most important. Because something you may not understand, God might be trying to teach you. And if you're in intimacy with him and going after him, then you'll learn. It may not feel comfortable. There, there may be things that will not feel comfortable in here. Okay, you can imagine, and I, I know I use, I use the example of deliverance a lot because we dealt with that a lot, still do. You know, when, when a person just right in the middle of worship or, or right in the middle of preaching or whatever just starts manifesting, you know, just cussing out God, Okay, well, you could pretty much guess that that is a deliverance situation. They're not speaking in tongues. <laughs> you know, it's not a message from the Lord. But you also don't, can you just hold on until I'm done? And I'm not saying that to you. I'm saying, can you imagine me saying that? If a person is, is manifesting and I just say, can you just stop manifesting? Wait till I'm done. I'm trying to get this point across. Then we'll deal with it after service. That doesn't work. You know, it doesn't work at all. So you deal with things as the Lord gives them to you. And I think that's why he said, you know, even, even what uh, church looks like is not what it's going to look like. It's going to look different. It's going to look like a hospital. I mean, have you ever gone into an ER? Pretty chaotic, huh? I mean, an ER can be very chaotic, but yet the workings of it are very flowing. Everything's as much under control as it can be. Honestly, that's how the... <laughs> yeah, true. That's how it's supposed to be in the church. The church is supposed to be the spiritual ER. So, did you have your hand raised? Or did, Georgia did, yeah. Yep. <laughs> You, you had a chance. I know we're already... So, Georgia, you're next. And then Alexis did. Okay. I'm seeing it. I don't know if it's in my spirit or just in my mind what's coming. It's First of all, I see two things. The people in the upper room. I mean, what, what was happening there? Were they sitting down, standing up, all around? They weren't sitting in rows like this with somebody up there preaching. Were they eating food? Were they just... How long did they wait for the spirit to come? But they were in unison, unity. Mm -hmm. We know that. Yeah. And the second thing I see is campfire. You know, if mm -hmm. anyone's ever been around a campfire, even with strangers, there's a really beautiful something that happens around a campfire. Of course, around our ignition fire mm -hmm. that brings out the, a unity. And I've even seen YouTube videos, whether they're true or not, of angels dancing with others around a campfire. So I see something relaxed like that, but yet very, very, very powerful and very different from what we're doing here. Thank yeah. you so yeah. much. And, and by the way, expect for God to show you those things because I, I remember first time I ever saw in the spirit, I was with Wendy and Anissa down in North Carolina and Wendy, or Anissa leans over to me. We're in, in the middle of worship. She leans over and she said, she said, 
there are angels all around this tent. There were probably, I don't know, 800 people in this big tent, and we're worshiping, and she said, there are angels all over around this tent. And that's all I remember her saying, and I remember thinking, so I kept worshiping, I kept thinking, okay, why does she get to see it, and I don't? <laughs> Lord, show, show me this. Show me this. And I'm, I'm, Lord, show me. Worship, worship, worship. Lord, show me. <laughs> Nothing. Keep worshiping. Worship harder. Show me, Lord. Show me. <laughs> Nothing. Okay. Literally, finally, the Lord, and I'm sure he was laughing. <laughs> he said, Greg, he said, you can't see with your eyes. You have to see with mine. Close your eyes. And I did, and boom. I mean, this wasn't a vision. It wasn't, it was supernatural, but I was with my eyes closed. I was seeing like I could see you guys right now. I still see Anissa, I still see Wendy, I still see everything else around me. I could, t- you know, whatever. I could, you hand me something, I'll take it from your hand. My eyes are dead closed. And I look out and I see these angels. And they were all around and they were dancing in a circle. And I, and I remember like they were doing this dance step. It was, they would kind of do this with their foot, this with their foot, and they jump up about seven, eight feet in the air, spin around, come down and do it again. All in perfect synchronization. And I said, so Anissa, I said, I, I just got to have proof of this. Tell me what they're doing. And she described the same thing to me. She saw the same thing. Or maybe I described it to her and she saw it. I, either way, we saw the same thing. See, that was the Lord breaking out. We're going to have that. Oh my goodness, claim it for yourself. Say, Lord, pull me into your kingdom. Let me see your kingdom as it is, not these walls as they are. Maybe in his kingdom, this wall's already painted. Wouldn't that be nice? Let it manifest in our kingdom, please, before I have to paint it. No, but, yeah, he's about to break out just some amazing things. I just can't wait. This is what we've waited for all along. And it is about just trusting him. It is about pressing into him. It is about loving each other. And I wish I could tell you like how it's going to go. I, I don't. He's, he's given me nothing about it except to let him know we're hungry for him. That's it. Did you have a question? Yes, um... I, you might want to answer this later, but because of my absence, I didn't hear what you, how you feel or how you felt about the COVID outbreak. Could you tell me or share that? About with me? COVID? Yeah. You mean about the, the whole thing. massive lie that yeah. ran through our world? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I won't derail now. I could tell you later, but basically, it. it It was pushed by the enemy, and it was pushed by fear. It's a a lot, that's the real terror of that is fear more than anything. Was that supposed to be like the the world outbreak or the world pandemic? No, no, I think that was just kind of like an appetizer. (laughs) I think think what's coming, here Alexis, you you have, um, I think what's coming is serious. Now it could be. Yeah, you come up here. Um, did you have a question though? No. I just, oh, I, it, it it could be that that. Like I I think something has to do with the vaccine in terms of the death, but the death is going to come in a lot of ways. I mean we we're kind of seeing things ramp up even. Remember creation starting to recognize the sons of God. What is what does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean that creation is all of a sudden going to become pretty, you know. I mean, when, when I get home after a two-week trip and Charlie sees me for the first time, he spazzes. 
he spazzes out, runs, runs, it's like get out a little bit of energy, and he's just going nuts because he's so glad to see me. I think that's how creation's going to be. I really do. I think it's going to spaz out. I'm hoping it will kill all my weeds so I don't have to. <laughs> Kill them all. <laughs> um, I, I did want to make a comment about uh, possible manifestations and needs for deliverances. There's no question we're going to see that. But the hardest thing that the Lord taught us in learning how to move and flow in the Holy Spirit was um, to listen intently to what each situation demanded. It wasn't to develop a policy that when this happens... You three ushers are going to take the person out and we'll deal with them in the other room. Sometimes that was what happened. Sometimes. Sometimes it was the entire church um, going ahead and the worship team engaging back in worship and we ward in the spirit in yeah. worship and there were three people just in the back row dealing with that direct person and that direct manifestation of the demons. But what there never was that the Lord taught us is never letting the enemy steal what God was trying to do in the move of his spirit. So I didn't want you to misunderstand when he answered that, you know, sometimes it, you know, it'll happen and you, you can't just go on and you can't just deal with it. There were many times he did just go on and someone else dealt with it. And, and I remember a couple of times being so violent, a couple of situations we dealt with were so violent, I kept thinking, you know, maybe I ought to flag Greg down and pull him out of the service to be involved. But he knew that no, the Lord wanted him delivering a message and that those he had called to deal with the situation were going to be filled and empowered by the Holy Spirit to deal with it. So it has to be a discerning of spirits in each situation. And that's where the, the church at whole, at, as a whole has, um, has lost that because we look for methods, we look for systems, we look for things policies that we can kind of adopt where we can get uniformity, whereas the unity described is in everyone being so solid in their relationship with the Lord. I remember noticing that I would look over at somebody that was filled with the Holy Spirit, and I knew they were thinking what I was thinking because we were both getting the same thing from the Lord, and we knew what to do. So that kind of a resolution to challenges that come is sadly a little not as known in the bride, but that's the normal that God wants. God wants the normal to be that we flow in him and that he's the one that leads us. So I just want to encourage you because some things flow through people's minds real quick when you hear some of the things Greg described or maybe hear some of his answers and you think, yeah, but what about this? And yeah, but what about that? Well, when you know, when you hear God's voice clearly and you flow in his spirit, he will guide you and lead you. I also want to challenge you, and this is really hard for me if I can be really transparent. I already feel it sometimes in this room that, and humanly speaking, it is a reality, that when the clock hits a certain number, there are just people we just lose. It's just, we just lose them. It's like, you know what? Gotta go, getting hungry, got plans. I, I gotta tell you, you're going to have to wrestle with the Lord on that. I absolutely love what Angie said yesterday. Or no, maybe she said it to me on a phone call when I had called her about something. And she said, I'm excited. She says, I'm just keeping my pillow and blanket in the car <laughs> to just be ready. And, <laughs> and you know, it, it is something, and, and this has been a challenge for my own uprooting of the religious spirit in my own life, is that things are structured Things are balanced. Things are, you know, done decently and in order. And to hold loosely your plans and to hold loosely your schedules and to just say, okay, Lord, I'm doing this. And it doesn't matter if 12 people are waiting on me at a party afterwards. If your spirit is moving, it will take precedence over everything, even people who might not understand. And those are, those are choices of faith, not because somebody legalistically guilted you into staying longer, um, but you're going to have to answer that for the Lord, uh, be, to the Lord yourself, because I definitely understand there are things, you know, we do, things we make plans, you know, we are actually leaving after service next Sunday. Um, Greg has a meeting um, in Virginia Monday morning, so we're going to travel and get there Sunday night. Um, and, you know, there are commitments you make, 
But guess what? If the Lord turns that upside down and we know that it's him, the plans will change. That's just the way it's going to be. And remember, what does Proverbs say? The, we make our plans, but the Lord orders our steps. Begin to practice that now, because otherwise you will get to a certain point where you're like, oh, spirit flow, spirit flow, because it's about 1045 and we're two songs in, and this is where I want to feel you the most, God, you know, because I'm here and it's just a good time. And he might say, how about give me another hour in worship when you may feel like you're done and then I'll show up. He did that at our prayer vigil. Did you know when we had a prayer vigil that one time and, you know, people were moved by the Holy Spirit, we had it at our home, and it was going to be till late. Holy Spirit came heavy close to midnight. Not everyone made it to midnight. Some had a plan, and that was totally fine. And they may have had to have a plan, and that's okay. And that's why I said I don't want this to be controversial. I'm just telling you the reality of it is sometimes he'll say, I'm going to show up and I'm going to show up for the people who are hungry enough to hang on when it's not convenient or when you feel like your body can't go any longer. And so take that to the Lord and be ready because he needs us to be willing to give him even our schedules and our plans and put him first. Father, thank you so much for this message today, God. We just love you. We praise you, God. We just acknowledge you and to say that, Lord, is so different than living it. We know the scripture in Acts that we live and move and have our being in you. But boy, walking that out experientially, practically, and really is so different than just saying it. We love when we feel your presence within the window of when we've scheduled to feel your presence. Oh, but God, when you, when you want to manifest, as you did to me one time, cooking for a meal when I was having my neighbors over. And I, you were so gracious with me, but I, I quenched the spirit, not even realizing it, because I thought, well, Lord, surely, surely you're not going to come upon me right now. I'm shaking like a leaf. i got to finish fixing this food. And that was not your plan. You wanted to just totally land on me in that moment because of what you had for my neighbors that night. And I learned so much from that. I learned so much from that. That it doesn't matter what you're in the middle of, what I'm in the middle of, when you want to show up, that is all there is. That is all there is. Will I make room for you? God, I pray that revelation over every single one of us. And it isn't a one and done revelation. It is a continual, deep revelation of a new way to exist in the kingdom, but here on this earth, to call forth your kingdom ways, not just your kingdom principles, but your literal kingdom ways into this realm on earth as it is planned in heaven. So God, I just pray that for each of us. God, for anyone listening online or who will listen online, God, that you would give them that revelation that even though we're so thankful for those that listen online and perhaps aren't even geographically close to us, God, that each one would not just have an online experience in the bride, but that they would interact and allow themselves to be refined by rubbing shoulders and doing life with the body of Christ. That is how a huge part of our refinement takes place, not just with you alone, but with you in the movement of our brothers and sisters provoking one another to love and to good works. So God, I just, I just thank you for what you're doing. God, I ask that you help us, challenge us, move in our hearts to cooperate with the new that is upon us and the glory that will result in that partnership and cooperation with this new that you will release by your spirit. I'm so excited. And yet I'm a little bit out of my element, for sure. Oh, but God, your arms wrapped around us will carry us through whatever our comfort zones won't let us do. So I just praise you for that. Have your way, have your will be done in this church, in this movement, and may we be obedient every step of the way. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.